Hey everybody, good evening. I'm just gonna check the audio, check the video real quick before we get into the meat of tonight's discussion. How's everybody doing tonight? Say hello. Let me know if you can hear me loud and clear and uh, how you're doing and where you're from. Let us know where you're from. Lucy March is in the audience. Michael Neiman, nice, nice to see you guys. Saw John Reddick up there, too. Some familiar faces from uh, Banjo Quest and some personal friends. That's nice. Western New York, West Virginia, San Diego, all over the place. Salt Lake City. Nice. Loud and clear in Lexington. Good. I'm glad it sounds good. I'm going to give us till about 7.05, guys, so we can just kind of shoot the breeze and talk here. Uh, there tends to be kind of a straggler effect on these live streams, at least the ones I've done. So it, it might be just the banjo crowd. Are we late for everything? <laughs> I've got Tony Thomas on the other line. He said, no, that's the fiddlers. <laughs> David Olney in the audience, south of San Francisco. Nice to see you, David. Glad you could come. Tom McKenzie, my buddy from Vermont, fellow banjo player. Nice to see you, Tom. Thanks for coming. Tony Thomas just said uh, you're one of his heroes, Tom McKenzie. Yeah, he's one of mine too, Tony. <laughs> Oh, somebody from Florida, Tony's neck of the woods. That's nice. I'm broadcasting from the North Shore of Massachusetts where we had a humid day. So it's very gloomy right now. I'm expecting a thunderstorm any minute. <laughs> hey, Blaze, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. We'll get started in just a couple minutes here. Thank you, Vincent. All right. Uh, I've got some notes here. I'm reading notes tonight. I'm not just going to wing it, as is per usual for me. <laughs> so uh, first off, I want to welcome everybody, and uh, thank you guys for joining this conversation about the Afro-Caribbean roots of the banjo. And before we start, I just wanted to thank Ryan Harlan, Herring McPickles himself, a patron of Banjo Quest and a very fine banjo player, I might add, for helping with the technical side of this uh, live stream and for moderating comments tonight. Um, if you could see the studio on your side, it's a disaster. Getting this set up today was scary. <laughs> I've done a lot of live streams, but never one where I've piped in an interview. So uh, lining it all up was tricky. And Ryan Harlan was instrumental in getting that started and helping me with that. So thanks, Ryan. He's out there. Give him a pat on the back for me. Um, <laughs> and Tony, Tony's clapping for you, Ryan. You can't hear him yet. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tom Collins, and I've been playing the banjo for uh, about 20 years now. And uh, through lessons, live streams, instructional videos, I have dedicated myself, my life, to opening up the world of banjo to anyone who wants to learn it. And I'm the founder of Banjo Quest on Patreon. And uh, that's me. But we're not here for me. We're here for Tony Thomas. And although I know my way around the fretboard, the history of this incredible instrument still eludes me. I'm still trying to get my mind around it. So I'm very excited to be joined today by someone who has probably forgotten more about the history of banjo than I will ever personally know. Tony Thomas is a leading scholar of the history of the banjo. He is the author of seminal publications on the African-American presence in country music, the banjo, and African-American musical culture, and our topic today, the Afro-Caribbean roots of the banjo. So thank you, Tony. I'm going to bring Tony in. Hold on to your hats here. Let's see if this all works. Somebody knock on wood for me. And we are live with Tony Thomas. Thank you, Tony, for this opportunity to learn about what is often called America's instrument. I cannot wait to resume our conversation. See, guys, uh, I talked to Tony about a week ago, and I was expecting a lot of information. But what I wasn't expecting was Tony to make history come alive for me in the way it 
did when he talked to me about it last week as we prepped for this. And the first thing I did when I hung up with Tony is I picked up my banjo and I started to play again because I was so excited to get the thing in my hands. So please, everybody, give uh, Tony Thomas a warm welcome. And hopefully everybody <laughs> can see and hear him. Let us know in the, in the uh, chat if you can't. Hey, Tony. How are you? Yeah? Tony's coming to us from Florida. West Palm Beach, am I getting that right? Nice. Thirty years before that. Okay, I but just. I'm originally from Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, okay. So you're you're northeast. Yeah. And uh, so. Uh, yeah, uh, Tony. Yeah. So the first thing I wanted to know from you um, before we get into Afro-Caribbean origins, I wanted to know how you found the banjo, because everybody's well, sort of got a different I, story okay, about this. I, I was interested in folk music when I was in high school. I'm 73 years old, high school, and I had various other interests uh, and to make a long sh story short, when I was uh, in my, I guess, late 40s or early 50s, I decided to get a MFA in creative writing. And when I went uh, to get my, my diploma, I didn't go. I went to a wedding of a friend of mine in New York, and I noticed I was seated next to John Cohen. And... Uh, the wedding band was Henry Sapoznik's band. Oh, and, my. Uh, the, uh, one, one of the uh, uh, people in the marriage is former brother-in-law of Ralph Rensler. And I should have known what was coming. When I came back to pick up my diploma, I had to go to the big campus of the FIU. And I thought that I wouldn't be able to use the library anymore. I, so I said, why don't I go in the library and get some stuff about stuff I hadn't been dealing with? And I uh, got uh, C.C. Conway's book, mm -hmm. uh, the African uh, Banjo Echoes in Appalachia, which uh, I was so excited. I started to try to Xerox the book instead of, you know, <laughs> I could buy one of my own. And... This intrigued me, and uh, about then, I first I got a guitar. I didn't. I only had an electric guitar then. I got a, uh, a a Martin guitar, and then right after that, I got a good time banjo, and uh, so I get. I found. Uh, I got into uh, going out and playing folk music, which I had done in Connecticut when I was in high school. In the first few years, I was in college in the '60s, and. It became, I became a number of people, one of a number of people. There were a number of people, many of us were academics, who would get, go to banjo conferences and things and, and complain about, uh, well, that nobody in universities is studying the banjo. And a bunch of us said, well, we're in universities or we know how to, uh, study things i teach uh, i was at, t at night teaching people how to write papers and do research why don't we do this <laughs> and i was very lucky to uh have and it's you know the internet uh exists so you have one person who has an interest here and there and they get together and there was really an international group of people who started exchanging about the banjo and more and more going from the kind of scuttlebutt where people just, just said what they wanted things or thought things should be to affirm their own personal beliefs or desires to, well, how do people study musical instruments? Mm -hmm. How do people study this kind of history? And a, a number of us sat, uh, went about looking into the history of the banjo that way. We were very much encouraged by uh, the Banjo Collectors Gathering. And now it calls itself the Banjo Gathering, but I'm sure, sure a number of us will always call it the Banjo Collectors Gathering, which started 
by these people like Jim Bowman and Peter Sago who have nine million uh, banjos. And uh, but they were interested in inviting people who study uh, the history of the banjo. They were interested uh, in encouraging uh, particularly people who were looking into the African roots of the banjo. They were interested in providing a forum for people who wanted to research the banjo and making that a feature of, of, of the gatherings. And it's something that uh, uh, I started participating and presenting at to look in what what is the history of the banjo or, or different aspects of it? How can we study it? Not uh, just saying, you know, typing on the internet what came in, whatever came into our heads or what we wanted to be, mm. but looking at the history. And I was able to participate in the experience of, of uh, mm. uh, working on this book, Banjo, Roots and Branches, It Belongs in Every Home. Agreed. Uh, which was the, the major portion of it were the collective product of a group of us about the origins of the banjo. There are essays on uh, a few other topics in, in that, and I was able to participate in that and work with some really great people. Robert Winans, the editor of this book, one of the, the best banjo scholars ever. Uh, Greg Adams, a great banjo player and also a scholar who's at the Smithsonian. And my dear friend who died several years ago, uh, Shlomo Pesco, who is a banjo player and uh, perhaps, uh, and, and he, he, unlike the rest of us, his only degree was from a uh, New Jersey high school, but he was a great, he was the real power behind this mm -hmm. and uh, delving deep into this and uh, especially looking at the African uh, instruments. And we found ourselves on the trail of the work of the great uh, Dina Epstein. Mm -hmm. Dina Epstein, and there's a movie about her that my friend Jim Carrier made, and I'll post links to get all, all of this stuff, was uh, a, a woman who was a librarian in New Jersey. She started out, and she ultimately became the head of the Music Librarians Organization in the United States and worked at the Library of Congress. But she... Uh, began when she was a housewife in the 19, late 1950s when they would not <coughs> hire married women with children to be librarians, even at town library, to research African-American music. And she found, and luckily for us with the banjo, that there was so much, uh, the, 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 the Caribbean islands, the French and English uh, Caribbean islands, and, and were much bigger deal than the United States in the uh, colonial period because that's where all the sugar was. The United States was just some place to grow food for them. And she uh, did this enormous research, you know, driving into New York City on, on, a, on a bus, go, spending all day at the library, uh, reading the colonial literature of, of, of the Caribbean. And she noticed... Uh, some of the earliest uh, notate, uh, reports of people playing the banjo. In, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, I could go all day about uh, how magnificent her, her uh, uh, work was. And, but she developed a method of doing this. Number one, she did it. Mm -hmm. um, she wasn't a music historian or a musicologist e either. But since they weren't doing it, she did this, uh, and she uh, brought to light some of our earliest reports about the banjo. We looked at the where the banjo came from, very objectively. We didn't. Most of us, I think, if you talk to most of the people who were involved in this in the year two thousand, we would have said banjos came from Africa, and that it looked at various ways that people would have brought banjos from Africa to the New World and to the United States in, in particular. Uh, we, uh, but we said we were going to follow what the evidence is. Mm -hmm. And the evidence, in, in, in a number of different ways, 
where the reports of uh, banjo playing uh, from the early days come from, uh, that, there no, that, that there's absolutely no record of banjos uh, being played in Africa except coming from uh, people from Europe or the Americas introducing them at a later stage. And we uh, uh, studied, uh, especially people like Pete Ross uh, and uh, Shlomo and others who were uh, banjo, uh, studying how the banjos were built, uh, their relationships to instruments in, uh, in West Africa. And we started to come to uh, an understanding that banjos originated in the Caribbean islands, uh, in the, it's probably in the six, sometime in the 1600s, hmm. maybe a little bit before, that they did not come from Africa, and uh, that they bore a relationship to a series of different musical instruments in Africa. We don't think that uh, one particular instrument like the ikanting was the the uh, missing link uh, to the uh, 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 the early early banjos, but that uh, the builders of the early gourd. I should I, I should back up. Okay. <laughs> in, in 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 we have a record of not just people writing about banjos, but we have pictures that people uh, uh, most mostly all. European travelers in especially first in Jamaica, then in Guyana, then in uh, other places, and including in the United States, drew of uh, the early banjos. We so those would be like the very first primary sources that you would see. Yeah, yeah. And we have in uh, museums in uh, Amsterdam, in. Uh, Brussels, I believe, and in Paris, and just recently discovered, just before he died, Shlomo discovered there was one in uh, Berlin. I mean, he, he was just, he could sit on his computer and discover things, you know. Uh, uh, and we have been able to go and look at them and examine them, especially banjo builders like Pete, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and look at look at them. And our, our, our conclusion is that banjos originated in, in the islands of the Caribbean in the 17th century, that's the 1600s, maybe possibly a little bit before, but probably sometime in the 1600s. The earliest uh, uh, record we have of a, of a banjo comes from 1887, a uh, man named Hans Sloan, who was a uh, from England, and he was a collector of uh, objects uh, when he traveled to uh, Jamaica and other places, and he had some very uh, detailed drawings of uh, several instruments which we consider to be banjos. Now, hmm. let me explain something. <laughs> the, thing that uh, distinguishes a banjo from other instruments, other instruments, it, it's, it's a very important uh, question in, in figuring this all out. Because instruments I have in my hand, I don't know how much detail you could see that this is not a, a, ba uh, a banjo or a, a plucked lute. This is a, a riti. It's a fiddle from uh, Gambia. And uh, the banjo, all, all of the lutes, uh, both plucked and, uh, that is, you know, strummed, mm -hmm. plucked is what the uh, fish, and, and bowed, which is fiddled, from uh, West Africa, all of them have pole necks like this. Uh-huh. No fretboard, just a pole. And, and, and they have these ropes uh, mm -hmm. here that are used for tuning. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
all of the early banjos that we know of uh, have uh, flat fingerboards and they have tuning picks. So a modern player might recognize them as a banjo. Yeah, we would recognize that as a banjo. Yeah, because uh, that doesn't look like a banjo to me. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't know what to do with that. <laughs> okay, but I mean, yeah. there are instruments. Yeah, like like the ikanting is probably mm -hmm. right now the most well known that are have similarities to banjos mm -hmm. that in in West Africa, but that had these things. And some people say, well, those are banjos. Yeah. So for what we we're talking about, we're saying that. A uh, banjo has a, a, a flat fingerboard, and it has tuning picks, and it has a movable bridge. Mm -hmm. And those are the uh, characteristics of the banjo. And there's no, uh, uh, again, most of us thought that banjos just came in general from Africa mm -hmm. and that we would, would find... Uh, if we looked hard enough, we would find banjos all over uh, the New World where people of African descent were or a pattern of banjos coming from other places. But we we didn't. And as we became the other thing happened is as we became knowledgeable of the uh, variety of, of uh, loot playing uh, traditions that do exist in West Africa, we came to see that there were uh, a number of different instruments that had similarities to banjos and especially similarities in playing where the playing resembled claw hammer mm. and, and even some with a drop thumb. And, and, and uh, you know, people uh, in, in the early 2000s would go over to Gambia and give a banjo to a, uh, an a, a counting player and something sounding like, you know, uh, you know, uh, maybe sounding a little better, but sounding like uh, drop thumb frailing mm -hmm. would, would, would be produced. So okay, that, yeah. Huh. So that's that's kind of what we again, uh, and then if you look at the pattern of when banjos began to be reported in uh, the United States, or what's now the United States when it was still English uh, colony, uh, it it starts to be when and where there are l large numbers of African Americans or. Uh, Af African slaves imported from these islands in the Caribbean. Uh, and, and our earliest report of a banjo in, in uh, the current United States was in New York City in 1736, uh, which stands to reason because in New York City in 1736 had the second largest uh, population of African descent in uh, North America after Charleston. Hmm. And it, it is believed that at least half of the Africans who were there had been e either born in the Caribbean or were uh, uh, children of people who had been born in the Caribbean. So that's, uh, that's, that's a very compressed, <laughs> Uh, a picture of where the banjo comes from. Mm. Do we have, is, is there any writing that indicates what what the music sounded like in the Caribbean in, in the 1700s? Any indication there, at all? Is there any writing about that? Yeah, there's some, there, there, there are several attempts uh, to do that. And I will give. And I have a page of links. Great. Uh, to that, uh, in Laurent Dubois, who is one of the main, he's it's it's just an actual wonderful thing that one of the world's leading experts on the French Caribbean, especially, uh, happens to be a banjo head. Laurent Laurent Dubois who was 
uh, teaches at Duke University. Uh, and it's one of the world, he's written these fantastic books about the history of Haiti, the history of Guadeloupe, uh, all sorts of things. He is a banjo player. And he came up to, he said, he said it all started, he came up to me uh, at the Black Banjo Gathering I organized in 2004 and said, hey, you think I could do some research? And we never saw him for, for a while. <laughs> and he's written this wonderful book because he is one, I, he, he explained, he's one of the big international experts on the history of the Caribbean in the oh. colonial period. And he just can tell major historians across the Caribbean or people in France who study the Caribbean, hey, I'm interested in banjo things. And they would send him this stuff. And he has, I mean, he's, uh, and he, he discusses in some places what this music sounded like. And there, they, he has a wit, rev, website, which I'll give you, you a, a link to, where somebody tried to recreate one of the early uh, banjo uh, thing, uh, tunes that uh, one of the, I think it was uh, Sloan, mm. uh, tried try, try to no, notate from the, late 1600s, early 1700s. Hmm. One of the things that we are also coming to learn through the research that Christina Gotti, who is a uh, fiddler and a banjo researcher in uh, Baltimore, who works with her husband, Pete Ross, who maybe banjo people know more. <laughs> and uh, she's just received a, a major uh, grant to do research on this from the American Folklore uh, Society is a connection, at least uh, from Suriname and other places, of the banjos with a number of uh, religious uh, rituals uh, that were uh, going on in, in the Caribbean hmm. and uh, in this period uh, were probably uh, going on among Africans who, who came to the United States. And that's one important thread that in the uh, census of since banjo roots and branches came out that we've we, we've we've mm -hmm. discovered, which makes sense because uh, if you look at early banjos, uh, they're not uh, many people think they're not crude affairs. They're very I I, I saw the oldest. Uh, 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 banjo we know about in Amsterdam in a museum there uh, at at the end of uh, I guess uh, just in uh, in uh, November about Thanksgiving and these are very impressively made hmm. they, they're made with uh, as uh, you know this is something that looks nice they're decorated with symbols that refer to the mythologies and, and, and the spiritual practices. Uh, so we we know that, uh, and, and Christina's work, which again, I'm in the links I have, is showing that at least one side of the uh, history of the banjo, especially in the Caribbean, that it was linked to spiritual practices that uh, different uh, people of African descent ca uh, carried out. In that uh, in in that period, did that um, did that banjo that you're talking about the early banjo? How many strings did that have? Does it have? Is it a five okay. string? Four. Four strings. Okay. No. In general, the yeah. early banjos tended to have three strings or four strings. Okay. With um, a short with a shortened string, Tony. With yeah, uh, yeah almost shortened all, drone. All, all almost all of them have a short you know, uh, like the fifth string in, in mm -hmm. the banjo. Uh, Chanterelle, I think, is the formal mm -hmm. musical name mm -hmm. for that. And uh, that's very similar to a number of the uh, West African uh, instruments we uh, know about that are part of the ancestry of the banjo. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the five-string banjo, and we'll talk about it maybe in an, a, another session, mm -hmm. comes in, it was probably uh, becomes popularized uh, uh, in the late 1830s and 40s 
uh, with minstrelsy and uh, uh, at, at another stage of development. Okay. And any, there are some questions about tunings. Any, any ideas of how those really early banjos were tuned at all? I, I, I don't have any ideas no. about it, except for they were, uh, from, from what we got, can gather, certainly from minstrel banjos, they were, they were tuned much slower. I mean, mm -hmm. in general, in music in general, even in formal music, there's been a tendency in the last 200 years for tunings to be raised. Part of it is the architecture of, uh, of, of instruments. You know, banjos were formally tuned once they came into being uh, formally in this country in the 1830s and 40s, three or four steps slower than they are today. They came starting in the 1870s and 80s to, to be tuned up to where they are today, especially in the United States, a little more slowly in England. But this is getting ahead of my uh, story, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. story we could talk about in another time. Yep. But I don't know anything about... Yeah. The, the, I would imagine that would be a hard thing to know, to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, without recordings of, uh, of any kind, um, probably very difficult. I think that's an argument for us to stop using capos but uh, and, and start to play lower. But that's just <laughs> that's just me. Oh. <laughs> um, cool. Well, why don't why don't we open it up for questions, Tony? What do you think about that? OK. Yeah. Um, and if anything else comes up, you know, we're everybody uh, we're, we're thinking of doing a, a multiple sessions because. You know, we Tony and I sat down about a week ago. We we once we sketched out um, what we wanted to do, what Tony wanted to do. It was clear that one session it wouldn't do the topic justice. So we're breaking this down into what we were thinking. What three sessions, Tony? Yes. Okay. So um, this will be the first. We wanted to talk about origins first. Then we wanted to talk about styles of play, knockdown style specifically, and finally. Uh, one of probably the most interesting and complicated aspects of the history of the banjo, we wanted to dedicate an entire um, evening about minstrelsy. So that's going to come on our third night. And we'll, we'll all post all this and, and uh, I'll announce all this later. And we will also compile a list of links for those of you who want to take this further and find out more. Uh, I'll work with Tony to get some links to some additional material. All right. Let's open it up to questions. There's a lot of them. I don't even want to begin to start scrolling through this list. There are, uh, Tony, 96 people in the audience right now, just to let you know, okay. <laughs> which is good, which is very good. Uh, all right, let's see. Who's got questions for Tony? Uh, oh, uh, David Olney, a uh, buddy of mine on the West Coast, said, is there any banjo leg legacy in the Caribbean now? Yes. I mean, there are a number, a number of different places in the Caribbean have their own banjo heritage, which uh, they consider indigenous. Uh, some of the, uh, in, in, in the uh, 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 certainly in the Virgin Isles. One of the biggest places is in Haiti. There's hmm. a whole... Uh, I mean, uh, when I was uh, uh, I first became interested in the banjo, I lived in Miami, and I and and I was also working in the transit agency there in the parts department, and I would bring a banjo in, not you know you 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 kill a banjo if you leave it in your car uh, all day at work in in in, in Miami and a Haitian. Uh, there's a whole troubadour music uh, uh, that's part of the Haitian folk culture and commercial culture that seems to be relate to an indigenous banjo tradition. Uh, in Jamaica, they have mental music. Uh, there's certainly in, in Jamaican interest in the banjo uh, interchange with uh, what was going on in, in, in Britain. Uh, the British banjo, uh, uh, but also from indigenous roots. So a number of places in, and in uh, uh, 
Martinique and Guadeloupe. There are uh, players, there's Kali, I think is the name of the guy that I listen to, mm. who play a, a uh, who play music on uh, banjos that is contemporary and uh, and and who are you know like we had a friend from Guadeloupe uh, who who comes to visit us with her daughter sometime. Oh, you've got Kali, you know. I mean, he's somebody that uh, uh, people know. So <laughs> there is uh, in in it's very it's very clear that it, it's in the English. Dutch and French uh, Caribbean. One of the mm -hmm. things that gives a pace of the origins of the banjo is that in uh, uh, Cuba or uh, uh, Puerto Rico, places uh, that had not been English, French, or Dutch colonies and a different pattern of where the slaves came from, there's not much uh, 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 indigenous banjo uh, history. There is a certain knowledge of it because from that, uh, uh, starting in the 1850s, uh, if not before, American banjo entertainers were going to uh, on tour in Cuba and places mm. like like that. But uh, but in a number of Caribbean islands, there is, are uh, uh, banjo traditions that seem to go back not to say the influence of American or English uh, banjo entertainers bringing it, uh, but uh, come from uh, are kind of come out of a folk tradition uh, from the original banjos. Hmm. Yeah, and there was a question about um, other islands in the Caribbean other than Jamaica, but I think you just. You just touched on that, that uh, it was pretty widespread. The banjo seems like it was pretty widespread island to island in the Caribbean. Yeah, in the, in, in the you know, if uh, Trinidad, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe, uh, Barbados, mm. in the Bahamas, all of these we have reports of banjos before what I call the Big Bang and the banjo in the 1830s and 40s when the banjos become uh, more of an international thing, uh, uh, but but not in uh, not in Cuba, not in Puerto Rico, and we could go on uh, because some of these places, Cuba had almost as many slaves were imported into Cuba as were imported into the the United States uh, during the colonial period. Uh, and there were much, there are much more direct ties with African culture and and uh, uh, than uh, in were allowed in the United United States. But outside of some influence from Americans uh, and uh, entertainers who started going there in the 1850s, and uh, uh, there's always been an interchange of uh, both slaveholders and slaves from Haiti in Cuba. But other than from that, uh, there, 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 there really isn't. Okay. Hmm. All right. Let's find, uh, let's find some more questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a, we have a frailing question. I know we want to save down picking for another um, for another session, but this this is interesting. Are there other instruments that use historically use this down picking style, or did that technique develop alongside the banjo? And we're probably uh, foreshadowing our next session here, but I well, I think that's an interesting question. Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah. there there might be, but I mean the what we call frail. Well, I call, I used to call it frailing. And now now it's called. Uh, Claw hammer and writing about music of the banjo use kind of neutral terms of down picking or down stroking. Mm -hmm. the, it seems to be uh, a a West African uh, thing among a number of the instruments that are uh, uh, we consider in the part of the prehistory of the banjo in Africa and. Uh, it seems to be the predominant uh, 
way that banjos were played until the 18, maybe the late 1840s or 50s, when, uh, although there is, uh, some of those instru instruments are played by uh, two finger picking, but I don't, if you want to go into this whole issue. Yeah, we'll save it. We'll save it. That's okay. good. That'll whet their appetite, I think. <laughs> uh, I'm really interested in that, in that topic myself. All right, let's see. I'm going to look for some more questions here. Um, get your questions uh, in, folks. We got about five, uh, ten minutes left here of our stream tonight. Ah, this is an interesting question for you, Tony. When do rim-based designs start to appear? Matthew Grupp wants to know. Do you perceive there to be an evolution from the calabash to wood rim design? Or do you consider gourd and rim instruments to be a parallel evolution? That's a great question. Well, I, I would rather talk about that in, when we talk about the minstrel phase. But, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, give, us it, a, give us a hint. To, to, to make a long story short, <laughs> it, that once uh, in, in, in the 1830s, uh, there, there probably were rim-style banjos being played, but once uh, in the 1830s, the rim style banjo, the rim or hoop head or, or frame head, the official banjos, the banjo took off. Hmm. I mean, uh, hmm. to me, if, if that had not happened, okay, uh, the banjo might be something we will be talking about as a historical thing that, that, that some people played. But it, and and I'll talk about it uh, in mm -hmm. another. But it's it's a essential moment mm -hmm. when that becomes popularized and replaces the gourd banjo, uh, in uh, in the history of the instrument, for a variety of reasons that would take you know its own presentation. I to, wonder if it was a volume thing. I wonder if it was. It, it was uh, just, yeah. It, it, uh, I don't know, and we yeah. we don't know very much about how this happened we know that it happened and then it, it became very widely popularized by a minstrels especially sweeney and then it spread like wildfire hmm. because gourd banjos you have to uh, i mean i talked to people like pete ross and others who uh who make gourd mm -hmm. banjos and gourd banjos are hard to make. You have to live somewhere, number where, number one, where you can grow a gourd. And they're all different, okay? <laughs> I mean, somebody like like Pete, who has spent 20, 30 years making gourd banjos, every gourd, you have to have a different strategy to, to, to make it. They're very fragile. The reason mm -hmm. we don't have too many from history is that they're biodegradable, <laughs> and, and and they're not. They're 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 grown by nature, and you can't design. You can't build something uh, like uh, you. They're restricted by the limitations of the gourd. So yes. once yes, uh, right, the right. frame-headed banjo becomes like. Uh, what people want, and, or people see that and see that idea, it, it takes off because it's easy to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's easy to carry around. You can you can work with it technically to make it uh, uh, what we have today. You can mm -hmm. you know give me a tuba phone. I don't want a gourd <laughs> bench. I got got one right here, but. But you know, I mean, I. But yeah, yeah. It it, it it allows that. Yeah, yeah. I have one from Jeff Menzies. Oh, hanging right over there. And uh, yeah, there. You also can adjust the tension on the head very easily. And on my minstrel banjo, hanging way up there, uh, an early design. Uh, you can. So that that certainly helps uh, from a playing perspective. It certainly helps from a sound perspective. So it seems like that uh, development of the rim really, that makes sense to me, that it would sort of catapult the banjo into the foreground of, uh, of American culture with just that very um, simple idea. Well, it, but it's, 
ideas are simple once you have them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay? That's if, true. If people go on several hundred years making banjos in the the Caribbean and in the United States, yeah, and you see that you, you just make it out of a gourd mm -hmm. uh, because you don't know, uh, and then then somebody makes one with a frame, and you say, oh. But it, but very often, I mean, very often the history of these things, uh, the, these practical issues yeah, yeah. of how you make something, how you can get something, and how you can use something mm -hmm. become, you know, uh, uh, practical. You know, yeah. it's just like when, it, it, it's, and, and, you know, we, those of us who played the fiddle know the problems of violin pegs so but, many <laughs> but yes. going from this these ropes to adjust your tuning to tuning pegs yeah and going from this kind of pole like neck which almost all of the uh, lutes that were played in west africa had and many still have today to a fingerboard mm -hmm. okay uh wow yeah, huge. You know, and things happen. Things. Well, a lot of this is not this mystical mm. cultural stuff that somebody wants to see some some uh, somebody see somebody else doing something. Somebody African see somebody using uh, a, 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 a number of the European lutes that were uh, co uh, common in the Caribbean in the 1600s and said, hey, instead of th that fingerboard there and those pegs, put that on, put yeah. that on this thing and we can go to town. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny how those practical innovations, uh, yeah, sort of drive the shape of the instrument. Um, just the practical considerations of how can we make this more playable. Um, uh, let's see what we've got here. We've got uh, there's uh, Burning Daylight is asking scale instruments for noting versus percussion, drum instruments, rhythm versus harmony. I don't know if that's a question, but I see something buried in there. Scale instruments versus percussion. Well, the most common from what we can gather uh uh, musical setting for uh, banjos before especially minstrelsy and if I did my own not totally scientific survey of a lot of the interviews that were done uh, with the former slaves by the WPA the most common setting of a banjo and it, uh, and it banjos in the early days uh, uh, in the 19th century was a banjo together with uh, percussion sometimes multiple percussion mm -hmm. I played for, uh, for a while uh, uh, with the Ebony Hillbillies which is a uh, uh, professional string band it's made up main, most of the people in it are uh, actually uh, musicians who have played uh, you know, seriously, in, in, in the jazz and soul music, the bass player player wrote, where is the love and just mm. the two of us, mm. for example. Oh, wow. Uh, and there's no guitar mm. in, the, in it. And there's several percussionists, including, you know, some really world class, mm. you know, one, one guy who used to be the house drummer at Motown and another guy who's flying around the world. And it's a different thing mm -hmm. and so the mixture the mixed relationship in understanding the early and african-american banjo playing and african-american music of a a setting where you're playing a stringed instrument with multiple percussion instead of the difference it is part of the roots that we have to look into more mm. of african-american banjo playing and 
and it's more part of what one would do if one were playing uh, West African music, certainly. Hmm. Seems like a lot of areas to, to study. It seems very cutting edge yeah. and open open to more. Yeah. So uh, keep that in mind, everybody out there in the audience looking to get into this. Fascinating. Uh, let's see. I'm going to find one more question. <laughs> it's uh, 752. We want to do one more question, Tony? Yeah, uh-huh. I'm, I'm you're home. good you're good all right maybe <laughs> maybe more than one get them in yeah. now folks get yeah, them in now no, I, I, okay I don't... uh sarah asks are there features of the banjo that specifically come from the indigenous people of the caribbean are there specific features tony what, what does she mean by the indigenous people of the caribbean i don't know sarah what do you mean by that <laughs> We'll wait. Um, I'm going to keep. Uh, let's see. Ah, here's one from Nick, Pennsylvania. Are there other banjo related instruments seen in the new world that have fallen out of favor, lost to history, um, fallen by the wayside of the banjo? Where Not, the banjo I sort mean, of eclipsed there, there are a them. Number of, there are a number of West African instruments that if you look in the history of uh, the Caribbean and the history of the United States that we have some reports of being played in America, but uh, uh, disappeared uh, mm -hmm. as 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 uh, instruments. There are uh, there was still in 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 in, in, in and this book uh, records a number of them. And there's some very good writing, uh, very good papers about early music in Jamaica that record some of them. But I, I can't think of anything that was that we know of that was related to the banjo. This is an interesting thing, really, that the, 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 the reports of where banjos were are fairly small. And I mean, when we began all of this, we thought that we were, it was just that people weren't looking. And if we looked more thoroughly around uh, the Americas, we would find a lot more. Well, we didn't. Hmm. But the uh, reports of other, uh, there were there, only one or two reports anywhere in the Americas of uh, West African lutes being played hmm. uh, uh, and, and so there are other many other instruments there are many parts of Africa especially in Central Africa like Congo and Angola where a huge part of the enslaved were taken especially to places like Mexico uh, Brazil uh, Peru uh, and Cuba, uh, where there's not very much of a, a lute tradition hmm. of, of, of playing lutes and uh, other instruments that were part of the musical traditions there. But what's interesting is to me is that as limited in focus uh, that the banjos in the Caribbean and in early America were, they're much greater than the, what we know about uh, lute playing in the rest of the Americans by this, the enslaved. Of course, that may be that people haven't looked for it adequately. Mm -hmm. That could be wrong, but it could, it could be, it could also be, uh, and it's, part of it is that, you know, why play this? when you can get a banjo. Why play this when you can uh, play, get a violin? I mean, many of us find the violin uh, to be a problem, but if you had to play this, you would welcome a violin. A friend of mine uh, is uh, the daughter of a person who was a very famous uh, violin player in the 1930s and 40s, first in Iraq and then in Israel. And she recounts how uh, musicians in the Arab East, uh, both uh, of Arab Muslim and Jewish uh, musicians, uh, 
in the late 19th century when violins and cellos and basses of the violin family were introduced to replace uh, uh, the earlier instruments that, uh, that were being played in the Arab world in Iran that are, the, the violin is really descended in. There was this big revolution because they were easily, uh, you know, easier to play. And it's this wonderful music, Arab music of these uh, ensembles where uh, the violins and cellos are a big part of it. Uh, I, I really listen to a lot of that now. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Uh, let me grab another question here. Um, is it true, and this is getting into the playing more, but it, I think this is relevant for tonight. Uh, Karen Holbert asks, is it true that early on in USA, the banjo play, was played for dances with drums without any fiddles? Looks like a banjo player looking for a fiddle-free space. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's where. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Ban banjos. I mean, I I am, I am a, a a person who is against the dictatorship of the fiddlers. You know. Uh, <laughs> Me oh, too. Uh, Me as too. I was saying, the the main performance. Uh. Uh that we see that they, if I look back in history about is you had very often, especially before guitars are known, the banjos were played with uh, multiple percussions. They were played with uh, 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 just banjos. Hmm. And the, 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 this idea that, I mean, uh, African Americans played fiddles, and and there's even older records of black people in this country playing fiddles. And there's a fiddle tradition with these uh, uh, from West Africa that was very strong in 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 America. And we could talk, I could talk about this for a while. But the banjo as an instrument, along with other instruments besides fiddles. And there are banjo tunes mm. besides fiddle tunes. And it, it, I go on a band, there's a banjo site on Facebook I go on, and people are playing these t fiddle tunes that no, in traditional or vernacular, whatever you call it, banjo playing, no banjo player ever played. We've never, never, I've had, maybe I have a thousand recordings of mm. traditional banjo playing on this computer mm. and there's no, you know, and, and we're, we're under this kind of bondage and discipline to these fiddlers. <laughs> it has to stop. I agree. I agree. Hear that everybody. <laughs> well, that is, that I think is a wonderful place for us to stop uh, tonight. We will Can be, con yes, absolutely. Go thing. for it, Tony, please. Uh, that okay i'm interested in history <laughs> yeah okay and this is something that i've always been interested in and in whatever i do if i got into writing i ended up and <laughs> i was in literary history but to play the banjo you don't have to know anything about its history you just know how to play it the way you want it <laughs> and also there's a lot of people saying well the banjo belongs to this group or that group or my group or the way i play it the banjo is the product of the modern world we live in, where uh, things come together, and the banjo belongs uh, to uh, everybody who plays it, everybody who listens to it, everybody who thinks about it, and all sorts of things are going on. Certainly, there's an important African uh, background to the origin of the banjo, an African New World invention of the banjo and African, there's a strong African American tradition of the banjo, which I would like to talk about it at some point. But uh, the banjo belongs to anybody who gets one mm. and anybody who hears one. Mm. And uh, okay, that's a beautiful that's a beautiful way to end this. You hear that, everybody? Banjo belongs to you, every one of you. Uh, Tony, thank you so much. That is, I, I'm so excited about our, our sessions coming up. Uh, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. Well, <laughs> there's a lot there. There's a lot there. And I think um, 
our next couple sessions are going to be really interesting. So um, thank you. Uh, everybody seems to be having a great time out there and is thanking you. So uh, that's really nice. And um, we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you. We'll see you. Well, yep, you're good to go, Tony. <laughs> I, I'm not much. Yep, you, yeah, you're not you're not on anymore. I'm gonna just say goodbye to everybody, do some bookkeeping with everybody, and nuts and bolts stuff, and you're free to go. <laughs> um, I will turn off Skype right now for you. And uh, respond to some questions uh, myself. All right. Thank you, Tony. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Oh, that was amazing. Ah, so cool. Gosh. I knew when I I, I Skyped him last week and I, I, I read his work. I've seen some talks uh, online with him. I didn't know what to expect. Boy, he just, uh, he he's encyclopedic, but he can really make it come alive, especially his discussion about sort of the practical uh, developments of the, 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 just the technology that goes into the banjo is endlessly fascinating. So I want to thank everybody for coming. There was a nice, huge turnout here. We had almost 100 people. I'm going to try to get more than 100 uh, for the next session. So maybe you guys can help me get the word out. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll mention when that's going to be on Patreon, YouTube, Facebook, etc. I'll post it to Banjo Hangout as well. All of the links that he was talking about, I'm going to just compile all of that material and I'm going to put it on the description of this video below. So if you're watching this at a later date or want to rewatch it, you'll be able to have access to some of the material that Tony mentioned in his discussion. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. With that, I am going to close the stream, fade out, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for coming. <laughs>